Hey everyone, how's it going? Happy Rusev Day. I got that in there. Welcome to No DQ video here on NoDQ.com and the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Aaron Rift No DQ. It is now December. It is that time of season. You know what this means. The NoDQ.com year end awards, of course. Head over to NoDQ.com right now. Get your votes in and please spread the word. Tell a friend, anybody who watches wrestling. Have them vote in the 2017 NoDQ.com year-end awards. This is the 18th straight year now for the awards. So check it out. And with that being said, let's get down to your questions. First one today comes from Warren Graham. Since Daniel Bryan has been favoring Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, do you see a Daniel Bryan heel turn coming soon? And how do you see Bryan as a heel manager? I'm not sure I would go as far to say that Bryan has been favoring Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, but maybe that's what the storyline will end up leading towards, where Daniel Bryan is, in fact, favoring them, and maybe Bryan will even do a full-fledged heel turn. I would not rule it out. I think it would be very interesting on a number of levels. First of all, would the fans really react to Daniel Bryan as a heel? That's the big question. I'm sure Daniel Bryan could cut a great heel promo. I have no concern about that, but I think Daniel Bryan coming out there, the fans would still cheer him anyways. So would that heel turn really work in that sense? Now, another thing I find interesting about this idea, I think it's a really interesting idea, if Daniel Bryan turned heel, this could potentially cool him off with some of the fans and maybe WWE might want to do that if Bryan is thinking about leaving and going off to wrestle on the indies again. Although you would think it would not make a difference since the indie fans will cheer Bryan no matter what, but maybe WWE could have some sort of plan to water down Daniel Bryan and have him as a heel before his contract expires and that way he loses some of his steam. We know how WWE booking can affect people. Look at Matt Hardy with the broken gimmick. It's cooled off significantly. I'm sure if he went to the indies it would be over, it would be popular, but the broken gimmick has definitely cooled off. So even though Daniel Bryan's not wrestling, he's still going out there doing the yes movement. He's still really popular with the fans. So. Could this be WWE's way of trying to cool off Daniel Bryan before he leaves? That would be very interesting if WWE did go full force with a Daniel Bryan heel turn. Would that be WWE's way of trying to cool him off before he leaves? Other than that, I really don't see a purpose in turning him heel because the fans are going to cheer him for the most part anyways. This one comes from Calvin. Hey Aaron, what do you think about Matt Hardy getting brainwashed by Bray Wyatt to become broken? They team up for a while until they can have a Wyatt broken Hardy match at WrestleMania. I did suggest this several months ago. I did bring up this idea and actually, as a matter of fact, now that I think about it, when I proposed my WrestleMania 34 card, when I did No DQ video episode number 1000, the match I had was the Broken Hardys versus Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman. And I think at the time I brought up the idea of Matt Hardy becoming brainwashed by Bray Wyatt. I think it would have worked, but it looks like WWE's not going in that direction with the Broken gimmick. It looks like the idea is that Matt is on this losing streak because of Jeff Hardy being injured. And Matt's trying to make it as a singles competitor and he's struggling, so he's starting to lose his mind. That seems to be the new direction for this storyline, which is fine. I think it's a good way to have Matt Hardy go crazy, have him go on this losing streak, and then he finally just snaps and becomes this character. Maybe not exactly the same character he had in TNA in the indies, but very similar now that Impact Wrestling is no longer legally pursuing the broken gimmick. But yeah, I would have been fine with the whole Wyatt family connection with Bray Wyatt, but it doesn't look like WWE is going in that direction now. But I do think it would have worked if they had decided to go down that route. This one comes from Ozzy. 
What was your initial reaction for the Steve Austin heel turn at WrestleMania 17, and was it the unofficial ending of the Attitude Era? Well, if you have watched any of my videos over the years, you probably know how I reacted. It was not in a positive manner. I was not a fan of it. I thought it was a sour note on otherwise the greatest WrestleMania of all time. And it was such a sour note for me personally that I consider WrestleMania 19 to be my all-time favorite WrestleMania ahead of 17, even though I think 17 was slightly better in terms of overall quality. It's just the ending was such of a downer for me personally. I've said it before. To sum it up quickly here, Steve Austin was this character that the fans were able to live vicariously through, you know, the, the corporate boss and his employee, Steve Austin being the employee and the fans being able to live through Austin. And when Austin turned heel, it just pretty much wiped out everything that fans had spent years getting emotionally invested in. And like JR said, it was the same thing as John Wayne running away from a fight. John Wayne was consistent through his entire career. And yes, maybe the Steve Austin character was a bit stale by that point. Turning him heel, though, and trying to make him a coward just did not work for the Steve Austin character. Maybe they could have gone at it a different way. I don't know. But first of all, turning him heel in Texas was a bad idea to begin with because he's not going to get booed in his home state. It was just, it was a bad idea. And uh, maybe it sounded more appealing on paper, but the execution, it just did not work out. And I'm not even sure if it was a very good idea on paper. I think the only logical reason to do it was the fact that Steve Austin felt his character was stale and needed a change. But unfortunately, the change severely hurt his character, in my opinion. And yes, I would say that was the end of the Attitude Era. Really, it was that week. It was the combination of the last Nitro, the end of the Monday Night War, and then WrestleMania 17 with the Austin heel turn. Austin was arguably the top representative of the Attitude Era, so when he turned heel, that was symbolically an end. But really, for me, it was the combination of WCW going down, being sold to WWE, and Steve Austin turning heel, and ECW as well, ECW also going under. All that happening in that short span was really the end of that era. You know, it was the Attitude Era slash the Monday Night War era. And for me, WrestleMania 17 was the, the true end of that era. This one comes from Mark Brown. Hi, Aaron. What's the one moment that almost made you not want to be a fan of wrestling? And he is a first-time asker. Thank you for the question, Mark. And I purposely put this question after the last one because they tie in together. It was this Austin heel turn. I was very turned off by WWE at that point, and I did get back into it once the invasion got going, but then by the end of the year, I got to that point again where I was, I was losing interest. Like October 2001, around that No Mercy period, I was just very down on the WWE product. And then once uh, they ended the angle and Ric Flair came back and Jerry Lawler came back, I started to get into it again. But yeah, there were, there were a couple of periods in 2001 where I was seriously just really frustrated with the direction of WWE. And I wasn't happy about the lack of competition, WCW going under. It, just, it was a depressing time to be a fan because after several years of wrestling being red hot, all of a sudden... There's one game in town, WWE's controlling everything, and, and the quality's going down. You know, WWE became a monopoly, and things changed. The wrestling business changed, and many would argue not for the better. This one comes from Is Israeli Wrestling Fan. What are the chances that this year in WrestleMania there seems to be a match between Kane and Finn Balor in its Demon version? On paper, I like the idea, Demon Kane versus Demon Finn Balor. I think it's a cool concept. I think a lot of it will depend on if WWE has anything else for Balor. If they really have nothing else, then maybe 
Kane would be a good choice for an opponent. But also keep in mind, Kane is running for the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. And I don't know if his run is going to last until WrestleMania. I think it will depend on him and how busy he is and what's going on with his campaigning. If this is going to be Kane's last run, if he's planning to call it a career after this and he gets elected and uh, he's doing other things, then maybe Kane will want to stick around through WrestleMania, but also that will depend on WWE wanting to give him a significant role at WrestleMania, which I think they should definitely offer it to him. You know, Kane has been a major star in WWE history. I think he should get one final match at WrestleMania. That should be his retirement. I think he's a big enough star to deserve having that spot. Um, and whether Kane can do it or not, um, that might depend on his own personal schedule and what he thinks he can commit to. Um, from what I heard, he was only supposed to be back temporarily, and this was just going to be for a couple of months. But we'll see. I mean, WrestleMania is WrestleMania, and um, if this is uh, Kane going off into the sunset, then I think it should be at WrestleMania if it's possible from Kane's end, and if WWE wants to do it, I think it should happen. This one comes from Stefan Osborne. Hey Aaron, I think WWE is holding off Balor's rematch with Roman Reigns or until after Roman Reigns wins at WrestleMania. I could see Finn turning heel with Anderson and Gallows to get the title off Roman. Then the Shield versus Balor Club 2, your thoughts. There you go. There's a there's a very solid idea right there. You know, I, I have uh, talked about Finn Balor being a babyface. I think he's good as a babyface. I think that character works well for him. But at the same time, some might feel, well, his character has gotten stale and Anderson and Gallows are going nowhere. So, you know, I think if you did have Finn Balor and Anderson and Gallows reunite in WWE, I think it would benefit Anderson and Gallows more than Balor. And the thing is, it's going to be that usual situation where if Balor turns heel to feud with Roman Reigns, the fans are still going to cheer for Finn Balor. So why turn him heel if he's still going to get cheered anyways? Um, so that's that's an interesting idea. I do like the idea of the Shield versus the Balor Club or some sort of tag match with those guys. I think would be interesting. Um, but I don't know. I don't know about a heel Finn Balor versus a babyface Roman Reigns. I'm not sure if that's going to be anything different than what we've seen many times over the years, like heel AJ Styles versus John Cena. You know, it's the same thing. I'd like to see something different, but you know. If it gets Finn Balor in the main events, then maybe that's a good thing. Got this one here from Samish. Hey Aaron, so one of the big four shows with the best stacked card of all time doesn't even deserve a new set. I have always been a big fan of innovative sets for different pay-per-views in the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression era. Do you like this cost-cutting method by WWE? I do think I do get this question every now and then. People ask me about the sets being generic, and, and this ties in with no pyro. WWE is trying to cut costs, even though, according to them, they're having record-breaking years, and they're making tons of money. But the thing about WWE is they run a tight ship, and that's why WWE has stayed profitable for so long, because they know how to market their characters, and they know how to cut costs and save money. Sometimes to make money, you have to save money. And uh, WWE knows how to not spend more than they need to. And, uh, you know, any successful business can learn from this. WWE, they are a well-oiled machine when it comes to running their company. Um, I've said it before, though. I've been very vocal about the pyro. I think it's a mistake to not have the pyro. The pyro adds to the rock show atmosphere of the live events. And on television, it's fun to watch, too. And if the fans are more excited, then the people at home are going to be more excited. So I just think it's a win-win. The pyro costs money, but I think it definitely enhances the experience of the show and gets people more excited to watch. And it's just a positive all around. As far as the custom sets go, yeah, I do miss the custom sets, but I understand why WWE doesn't do it. We're in, we're in a different era now with the technology. WWE has the big screens, and they focus on 
the the big high tech graphical effects with the the HD screens. Um, so it's just a different era now, and WWE utilizes the technology in a different way. They like using the screens for the graphics and all that, and everything's shot in high definition now. So it's just a different era. But I would like if WWE did do more in terms of customizing the sets. Like WrestleMania, they don't do it that often, but they do every now and then. For WrestleMania, they did have the roller coaster. And I, I, I'd like to see more of that, at least for the major pay-per-views, like the big four pay-per-views. I, I do agree. I miss those old sets, um, especially the WCW ones. And uh, WWE had a lot of cool sets as well. I, I do miss those, and I wish WWE would bring them back to some degree. Got this one here from Oscar. Are there any wrestlers you'd really want to sit with and have a serious discussion about their career for NoDQ.com? There's only one that I think I would really like to talk to because very few people have gotten this opportunity to talk to him and really get him to open up in an interview. And that's Vince McMahon. That would be the guy. We've heard Steve Austin. Steve Austin has his own podcast, so we know everything there is to know about Steve Austin. He has his book. All these guys like Hogan and Flair, they've all been very outspoken about their careers. But Vince, we haven't really gotten that real definitive Vince interview. Yes, he did have that McMahon DVD, but Vince hasn't really done this tell-all interview where he has just opened up about everything and, you know, really talked about all of these topics that you're wondering what's going on inside his head, like Chris Benoit. You'd like to know what's going on with Vince and his feelings on Benoit and the steroid scandal in 92 and the stuff with Pat Patterson, um, all those accusations at the time, the XFL, all these different controversial topics um, and just pick Vince's brain about all this stuff. That would be an all-time classic interview. So whoever can finally pull that off I mean, that would be a huge interview. I mean, the biggest interview, in my opinion, that anybody could get would be that kind of interview where Vince would, would hold nothing back, no holds barred, would open up about every topic you ask him. Owen Hart, all, all these controversial topics, you can get Vince to be 100% honest and just open up about all that stuff. That would be a dream for me to be able to have that kind of interview with Vince. But... I, I highly doubt that will ever happen, and I'm not sure Vince will ever open up to that degree to anybody. You know, I think he'll do these interviews um, on the WWE Network, but he's only going to say so much. And I think there, there may be things about Vince that he never opens up about. That's just the way it, it is, it seems. And, you know, he's, he's not getting any younger, so if he's going to do it, he should probably do it when he still has a fairly good memory of some of these events, you know. So we'll see. We'll see if it happens or not. I hope it does, but I'm not getting my hopes up. Got this one here from B Money. What are your thoughts on the Triple H and Booker T promos in Feud in 2003? Watching back then, they did not pay too much attention to it, but watching it back today, there were actually a lot of racial undertones in it. Were they going for racial or just burying Booker T being from WCW? I think it was the old school mentality of Triple H trying to be an effective heel, making the racial comments. Um, it didn't go over very well back then. Um, today it would be worse with the way our culture is in 2017, but even back then, I mean, it did not get as much heat as Katie Vick, but still a lot of people thought it was in really bad taste for Triple H to make the racist comments towards Booker T. And then for Booker T to not even get the revenge. I mean, it's one thing if Triple H is saying that stuff about Booker T and then Booker T beats him at WrestleMania. At least Booker T, the character, gets the redemption. But the story is Triple H mocked him and made those racial comments and then Triple H still beat him anyways at WrestleMania and um, Triple H moved on to the next guy. So I could definitely understand why that whole storyline rub people the wrong way. And the match itself was just a big disappointment. Um, you know, as much as I love WrestleMania 19, you know, if I had to criticize something, um, that, that world title match, Triple H and Booker T, was definitely 
the low point of that WrestleMania. The storyline wasn't good, and the match wasn't good. Got this one here from Smirtaza. Do you want Batista to return and win the Royal Rumble? No. I know he already won in 2014, but Roman also did in 2015, and Batista versus Brock is much better main event than Roman versus Lesnar. I agree with you on that. Rumble will be the best place for Batista to return. What do you think? I don't think he should be winning the Royal Rumble because it's in Philadelphia, and I'd rather see Batista just come back and get the shot. I think having him win the Rumble is a mistake because the fans, I feel the fans want someone new to win the Rumble. And I've said this myself personally. I think a younger guy should be winning the Royal Rumble match. I want to see Nakamura or AJ Styles if he loses the title soon. I want to see one of those guys win the Royal Rumble. Somebody who has never won it before. First time winner of the Royal Rumble. That's what I want. I don't want to see Batista win it. I don't want to see John Cena or Roman Reigns win it. I want to see somebody new win the Royal Rumble. If you're going to bring Batista back, awesome. I love it. But don't have him win the Royal Rumble. This one comes from Kyle Allen. Should WWE ditch Total Divas and Total Bellas and replace it with a women's wrestling show? Now, see, I have mixed feelings about this because I think a women's wrestling show would be a cool concept. I did talk about this a little bit on the last video, but I do feel it's oversaturating the product. And you do have Total Bellas and Total Divas. So the question is, could you replace those shows with the women's wrestling show? I would say yes, except I think Total Bellas and Total Divas, those shows do serve a purpose in WWE. Those shows help bring in new eyeballs to the product, in particular female viewers. Um, Total Divas and Total Bellas, those shows draw a lot of female viewers on E! And it helps bring in some potential new female fans. So those shows do serve a purpose and do help WWE. Um, so would a women's wrestling show draw in new viewers? That's the question because most likely this show would be on the network. Would this show attract more female viewers? And I don't know if it would, you know? I'm not sure if it's going to lead to casual female television viewers saying, hey, WWE has a women's show, let's subscribe to the network. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I don't know if that's as effective as doing Total Bellas and Total Divas. So I, I'm really not sure if it's a good idea or not. Uh, but in general, I feel there's too many shows. And as far as a replacement goes, I'm, I'm very much on the fence about it. I don't know if it would work or not. This one comes from Lar B. Do you see Carmella's Money in the Bank gimmick getting lame? And don't you think she should use it before WrestleMania? If a Women's Royal Rumble is happening, who do you pick to win? Well, regarding Carmella and Money in the Bank, you know, I think it's good to have her cash it in as far away from the Money in the Bank pay-per-view as possible since we had that cash in fairly quickly afterwards. You know, spread them apart a bit. Let there be some time where you have the, the woman holding the case or the man holding the case. I think WWE did miss an opportunity, though, with the debut of the Riot Squad. Um, Carmella had a perfect opportunity to cash in, and she did not do it. Um, so when is the right time going to be that will make sense and make her character look smart and not like a complete idiot? That I don't know. Now, as far as a Women's Royal Rumble match goes and who would win it, um, I think I would go with somebody like Charlotte. I would have Charlotte win it or maybe have Ronda Rousey's um, tag mates, fellow four horsewomen, one of them win it, or even Becky Lynch, somebody like that. You know, ha have somebody win that's going to help set up a WrestleMania match. Um, hell, even Ronda Rousey being a surprise entrant and winning would be, would actually be great, I think, for WWE because it would it would maybe generate some headlines for the Royal Rumble. Um, so I, I think that that would be really interesting. But right now, it's all a big question mark if there's even going to be a Women's Royal Rumble. So, you know, I'll talk about it more if WWE officially announces it. But until then, you know, it's all just speculation at this point. 
That'll wrap it up for this edition of No DQ Video. Thanks as always for watching. Again, go over to NoDQ.com and vote for the male superstar of the year and the female superstar of the year and the other categories in the 2017 NoDQ.com year end awards. Check out the other videos on the channel and I will see you guys next time.